aan te houden. En, nee, er is nog even mee. Dus, uh, het was een beetje timing. Uh, ik heb dus het voor jou aan uh, waar je moet zitten bij je school. Dus dat is aan het schrijven wat het doet. Is that if we see if I don't use them, can you still fill them or is it connected to that? No. no. So you don't need that? <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because in the course of when you're speaking, and I'll try not to, um, I end, usually end up shooting more. Uh, I'm out of bounds. See if you've got a mic, it's, it's, it's not as good, so I apologise. Can I also apologise for being a wee bit late? Um, I'm hoping I'm actually going to put a wee message out on Twitter later on tonight, uh, asking if anybody's got a sat nav that I'm not using. Uh, I'm doing that many meetings in and I keep it close, so if anybody's got one, it would be very welcome up in September. Um, as Billy said, um, I'm going to try and make some of the arguments for why on the 18th of September people in this room and everyone in Scotland should take the step to become an independent nation. Should take the step to stand on our own two feet. That's not any better than any other country in the world. But certainly not any worse than any other country in the world. I'm going to try and convince you of the argument for yes. And for those of you here tonight who are already convinced that you're going to vote yes, I hope we can get some inspiration going and you won't just be yes supporters but you'll be yes ambassadors as well. For those of you that are undecided, I hope that we can, at the end of the evening, have made enough arguments that you leave this room saying, no, I'm not undecided any longer, I'm going to vote yes. And if, for those of you who are here tonight, out of curiosity, you are maybe saying right now that you're a no voter, I hope what you'll hear tonight, if it doesn't decide that you'll change your vote, at least it will encourage you to think a wee bit more about it. So hopefully there's something for everyone in tonight's uh, meeting. I do want to just take a couple of moments to mention Sharon, who has organised tonight's meeting. Sharon has done what Liam did, and Liam's in the audience as well here, from Cumbernauld. And Liam from Cumbernauld a few weeks or maybe months ago contacted me on Twitter to say, Tommy, I'm very much for independence. I'm fed up with people being frightened. I'm fed up with all of the fear that we're getting in the media. Would you come out and speak at a meeting and come along? And I sent him back a message in. Yes, no problem, Liam. And then he sent back a message in. Well, that's great. What do I do? I've never organised a meeting in my life. He went ahead and booked a room. He went ahead and got publicity. We went ahead and had the meeting and 200 people turned up. Sharon was going to come to that meeting, but I believe she had a fitness class that night and uh, couldn't get away from the fitness class. So she contacted me and said, would you come out and do a meeting in New York Hill? And I told a few moments ago, I'd never met Sharon. We uh, exchanged messages on Twitter and she said she was determined to give people the opportunity to hear some of the arguments for independence. And now look around you folks, what can happen? Somebody who's never organised a meeting before in her life She's done a great job. Uh, so I want to <laughs> We are in the uh, Keir Hardy Memorial Primary School. And um, I have to apologise to my daughter and to my wife, more to my daughter than my wife who are here tonight, because um, whenever I say to Gabrielle, I want you to come in one of my meetings, she always says, oh, Daddy, no, again. <laughs> I've heard it all before. Um, and that's life. Um, fortunately, she's beginning to take some things in, because I said to her, um, before the meeting we had in Cumbernauld, uh, uh, sorry, in the uh, Cumbernauld, um, just about 10 days ago there, I said, what can you remember? And she says, you keep going on about the selling in the house and Alex Salmon. And I said, what do you mean? She says, that story you keep telling about the house. And I thought, right, that's no bad. And of course, the story is, if each and every one of you were to think for a moment about the opportunity to buy an absolutely idyllic house, it had three or four bedrooms, whatever was your preference, it had a beautiful garden, lovely kitchen, beautiful driveway, 
and you could afford them. But they didn't like the decor. And you decided, I'm going to buy that house because I don't like the decor. Now that sounds absolutely stupid and ridiculous. And it is just as stupid and ridiculous as anyone saying they're not going to vote yes in September because they don't like Alex Salmon or they don't like the SNP. You see, after September 18th, there will be elections in 2016 where this independent country will choose whatever politicians and whatever government they want to govern them in an independent Scotland. So September 18th isn't whether or not you like SNP, whether or not you like Alex Salmon. September 18th is about whether you think Scotland should stand on its own two feet and be an independent country. That's what you're voting for. You're voting for hope over fear. Hope for the future and what a small independent country could do, not just for you, not just for you as adults, but for your children and your grandchildren. Think about the nature of the country that you want your kids and your grandkids to live in. That's what September 18th is all about. And that's why it's such an important vote. You know, I want to tell this wee story because the wonderful Keir Hardy's portrait is at the back of the room on the wall. And Keir Hardy was one of those inspirational characters in history who was brought up in poverty, was working in mines at the age of nine, was sacked by the age of 12, knew what real poverty was all about, and he set about the building of a political party that would represent the working class. Because in his day, there was no party represent the working class. You could say we're going back to the days of Kiradi right now. In those days, the Liberals were supposed to be the workers' party. When Kiradi used to address meetings, he was getting stoned by miners who thought that he was splitting the vote. Now he's revered by miners and every other working class person with a sense of history. And Keir Hardy had a programme that he introduced in 1888 when they formed the Independent Labour Party. Independent Labour Party was a forerunner for the Scottish Labour Party and then the Labour Representation Committee of 1901, which became the Labour Party itself. Keir Hardy, in that programme, he had a commitment to home rule for Scotland. He also had a commitment for the abolition of warrant sales. Way back then, 1888, the abolition of warrant sales. And the reason I mention that is I want to use a story of what happened in the Scottish Parliament to illustrate why we need independence. I was elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Seven years before that, I was in jail. I was in jail because I played a part in preventing the first attempted poll tax warrant sale. Some of you might recall that during the Haiti poll tax and the campaign against it, the councils used the threat through sheriff officers that they were going to come to your house they were going to price your goods, they were going to take it out of your house, and they were going to sell it. They were going to carry out warrant sales. They were going to humiliate you. Because they were only going to raise the debt. Warrant sales don't raise debt. What they do is they frighten you and they humiliate you. And people like myself and thousands of others said, no, we're not having that. And we stood outside people's doors and we stopped the sheriff officers getting into their houses. And then we got a call in September of 1991 from our lone parent in tears in Greenock. We come back from shopping one day to find a note in her door saying that she had to go down to the local sheriff officers, Abernethy McIntyre in the centre of Greenock, to pick up a new set of keys because her door had been broken down, the lock had been replaced, and she was to pay the locksmiths for replacing the lock. Sheriff officers went in when she wasn't in the house. They took out a display cabinet, a coffee table and a television. They were going to sell it a warrant sale on the 1st of October 1991. Myself and about 500 others said, no, they're not. 
The day before it, I got this wee note through the door called an interdict. And it told me that I wasn't allowed to interfere with this legal warrant sale. Well, we decided that there's a difference between the law and what's right and what's wrong. And unfortunately, when it came to that particular instance, we were prepared to break the law because it was right. It was morally correct to stand with our lone parent. I actually ripped up the wee bit of paper and said, no, we're not going to be stopped from being here. After about two or three hours in that yard in Turnbull Street, the police announced, the warrant sale is off. The women got her stuff back. There was never a warrant sale thereafter in Scotland. Seven years later, I was elected to the Scottish Parliament. I was able to stand up in the Scottish Parliament. I'm very, very proud of the fact that we all of the support I had from behind me and with the campaign that we had during the poll tax campaign, I was able to move a bill, brothers and sisters, a bill to abolish warrant sales. So we stopped them physically when it was against the law and then we get the opportunity to do it legally when I was elected to the Scottish Parliament and it was the first private member's bill ever passed for that Parliament. Incredibly enough, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but incredibly enough, believe it or not, the Labour Party, under Donald Dewar's instruction, was told to vote it down. There was a rebellion within the Labour Party. It's the first time there was a rebellion. It's unfortunate. It's the last time there's been a rebellion. <laughs> They decided they couldn't do that and they voted for that bill and we abolished warrant sales. Brothers and sisters, that story has a moral to it. Here Hardy in 1888 went to the abolition of warrant sales. It took to 1999 before we got them abolished and it needed a Scottish Parliament to abolish them. But see when it came in 2003 and we debated in the Scottish Parliament whether or not the war in Iraq was legal, was moral, and whether kids from Scotland should be sent to fight that war. There was a majority opinion in that Scottish Parliament that said that was not a war that was based on weapons of mass destruction. That was not a war that was based in the tyrannical rule of Saddam Hussein in an attempt to attack him for that because he was Britain's trading partner for years beforehand. Anybody who thinks that war was about weapons of mass destruction, was about the tyrannical rule of Saddam Hussein, has to waken up and smell the oil. That's what that war was all about, brothers and sisters. And hundreds and thousands of young kids, many of them from Scotland, were sent to early and very bloody graves on the back of the lies and the deception of that war criminal Tony Blair and the rest of the front bench of the Labour Party. And it's to their eternal shame that they lied to the country in order to justify that illegal evasion. Never mind, never mind the one million Iraqis that died as a result of that illegal invasion. The point is, brothers and sisters, the Scottish Parliament voted against the Iraq war and we were laughed at by Westminster and ignored by <coughs> Westminster. Because yes, we can abolish warrant seals. But when it came to the question of war, we were completely helpless. We as a country couldn't decide whether we would be involved in such an adventure that was based on illegality and deception. What we are saying in the September 18th, folks, is never ever allow us to be put in the position again where we can't have a say on whether we are involved in wars in any other part of the, the, the world. Never ever allow us to be put in a position where kids from our housing schemes and our villages are sent to take part in illegal wars because we don't have the power to stop it. Sovereignty, the right to run our own affairs, that's what we will have on September 19th if we vote yes. I'm going to say to you, if I was to ask how many of you would like, and let's just get the figures, how many of you would like five brand new hospitals, 100 doctors, 100 dentists, 10 secondary schools, 200 
teachers, 30 sports centres. Jewel the A96, Inverness to Aberdeen. Jewel the A9, Perth to Inverness roads. Sounds quite good, that, doesn't it? More schools, more doctors, more teachers. Well, you know what? That's what we can have every single year when we get rid of nuclear weapons. Because the two, the 2.125 billion pounds, which is Scotland's annual contribution to the upkeep of the Trident nuclear weapons program, is what we will have to spend, not on worthless scrap metal that you're never ever going to use anyway, because if you use it, the planet's finished. Instead of spending billions of pounds on illegal and immoral weapons on September 18th, folks, you get the chance. You get the chance to decide. No, we don't want illegal, immoral nuclear weapons. We want more schools, more hospitals, more doctors, more nurses. That's what we think Scotland should do with its resources. Not be part of the warmonger programme that believes we should have an arms race and that weapons are more important than looking after our children and looking after our elderly. People say, you know, people say to me all the time, folks, you know, Tommy, you can't be certain what it's going to be like in an independent Scotland. Are we going to be able to maintain our welfare state? Are we going to be able to maintain our National Health Service? I've got to say to you, every single one of you, think for a moment what September 19th is going to look like if we vote no. Because if we vote no, the welfare state is getting dismantled before your very eyes. It's the people in benefit today, yes, they're the scapegoats. They're the enemies, they're the people that are getting the brunt. The lone parents. It won't be long before it's the pensioners who are going to have to work longer and get less in return. The welfare state has been dismantled and our national health service has been privatised. That's the reality in England, folks. Don't believe me? Go on to YouTube. Look up the NHS consultants themselves who have said loud and clear, if we vote no on September 18th, within five years, within five years, the National Health Service in Scotland will be susceptible to the same privatisation that's happening here and now in England. And within 10 years, we won't have a National Health Service that is recognisable because the privateers will have taken over. Brothers and sisters, that's the road they want to take us down. If you vote no on September 18th, please do it in the understanding that you're sticking with a Westminster plan to privatise public services. Privatise not just the Royal Mail that they're already committed to doing, but the National Health Service as well. And all other local authority services are up for grabs. Anything that can make them money, they're going to privatise it. That's the reality, and by the way, by the way, even, and it's looking more and more unlikely anyway, but even if Mr. Miliband was to win the election next year, how many of you have a confidence in Mr. Miliband? I don't know. I certainly don't have. No wonder. They're neck and neck and in some of the polls behind the Tories. Behind the Tories! So they're telling us, they're coming to Scotland and saying, oh well, you know, if you vote, no, don't worry, we'll give you extra powers. You'll give us absolutely nothing because you'll not be in power. That's the reality. Let's not kid ourselves here, folks. Let's not kid ourselves. What's going to happen next year at the general election? Most likely is a right-wing coalition of the Tories and you can that's the reality. That's the reality. Wake it up. By the way, that's going to let liberals a 
off the hook. You know, Mr. Clegg, Mick Clegg, apparently was up for an Oscar recently. Four years a slave. <laughs>
is we have a situation in this country where for ordinary people, if you don't pay your taxes, you'll be hauled up in front of a court and your feet will only touch the ground and you'll find yourself in jail. If you're a millionaire, it's optional. It's optional. If you're a millionaire and you're a pal of the government, not only is it optional, but you don't need to pay your taxes, you can still get a knighthood as well. That's the reality. We have got a very unfair and unequal society, folks. Cheap by jewel, with those figures, the largest ever growth since records began, and the level of income for the rich. In the last year, 900,000 more people condemned to poverty. 900,000, 1 million people, 300,000 of them wanes. And the key is, the key for tonight's discussion is, the quote from the Child Poverty Action Group, most of the cuts that have been agreed have not yet been implemented. People will feel their effects over the next two years. That's the reality. You think things are bad, the no. Things are going to get worse. We have an opportunity here in Scotland to say no to the neoliberal economic nonsense that says the way to help the rich is to cut their taxes but the way to deal with the poor is to make them poorer. We should reject that neoliberal consensus and say we're going to do things differently here in Scotland. We're going to do things in danger of abandoning the working class in England and Wales. I've heard it from some people who should know damn better. Are we not in danger of abandoning the working class in England and Wales? I say to those people, that is a false argument. It is an incorrect argument. And it is a very dangerous argument. Because what we will do here in Scotland, folks, when we vote for independence, and we tell the privateers to get their hands off the mail service, when we tell the privateers there's no place for them in our national health service, when we tell the privateers that the railways are going to be taken back into public ownership, when we tell the employers that the minimum wage is too low, you're now going to have to pay a living wage, not a minimum wage. When we in an independent Scotland take those small steps, we aren't abandoning the working class of England and Wales. We are leading the working class of England and Wales. Show them in action, folks. This is what's possible. This is what you can do. You don't have to accept the crap from Westminster and the Westminster village. You know, we're not here tonight, and I'm certainly not here tonight, to ask you to endorse the white paper, to ask you to endorse the SNP or the government's vision. For independence, God. I've got to applaud the SNP. I'm not a member, I'm not a supporter, but I applaud what the SNP's done to keep the question of independence on the agenda. Well done. But you know what independence is about? It's about our vision. It's about your vision. You see, in the white paper, they give a commitment to save the mail service. In the white paper, they give a commitment to a living wage. In the white paper, they give a commitment to keeping the health service public. So all those things I mentioned earlier, they're all there. What's known in the white paper is what I see in an independent Scotland. Because in an independent Scotland, folks, I don't see September 19 as the end of the journey. I see September 19 as the start of the journey. The start of a journey to transform Scotland for the better. I think we as a small nation have to look at the power companies, electricity, gas, oil. That's what I see you. That's what I see you loud and clear, folks. Why the hell do we allow private profiteers to make money every time you switch your lights on? Every time you put your gas bulb? Why don't we do what should have been done under the Labour government?
chance to do it. Why don't we take back what is rightfully ours and publicly own the gas and the electricity? Instead of creating 
creating more jobs. What you start to do is create better job conditions. You say, I don't want, I don't want an independent Scotland where you work an average of 50 hours a week. I don't want an independent Scotland where everybody works that hard to provide for the wage. How many of you? How many of you do it? And your, your pals and your family will say, why are you working on that overtime? Why are you working on the weekends? And your answer will be, oh, it's to provide for the wage. It's, you know, to help the wage out. And then when somebody says to you, when's the last time you actually sat down with the weeds and read them a book? When did you sit down and have a chat with them through the homework? Any time to do busy work. Folks, that's not my vision in independent Scotland. My vision in independent Scotland is a shorter working week. <clears throat> my vision of an independent Scotland is we go the way Francis got done it. They went for a 35 hour week, but they're going to a four day week. What's wrong with that? Why should we not release people that they can spend time in their hobbies? They can spend time in sport and leisure. They can spend quality time with their children. All of that is possible. This is the rocket science we're talking about here. These are things that are very, very practical, very, very possible. In my independent Scotland, folks, when you next go to the Motherwell Town Centre or get into Glasgow, I guarantee you, you're not going to get anybody standing in front of you with a collecting can saying, please help us, we're trying to paint the new ward at the Sick Children's Hospital. Please help us, we're trying to build an MRI scanner because we only have one. Please help us. We're trying to research more into cancer. Folks, they're not going to be there. Because we're going to spend the resources making sure that kids hospitals and MRI scanners and cancer research is taken care of. But I'll tell you who will be in the streets. that will be your George Bloody Robertsons, your John Reeds, your wee Jack McConnells. They'll be in the streets. Cans and there will be stickers and they'll be saying, Please help us, we're trying to build a nuclear weapons program. Brothers and sisters, I cannot for the life of me understand why we are allowing ourselves to be frightened. We're allowing ourselves to be persuaded by the arguments of darkness. We're no big enough. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. 32 of the last years, 32 of the last financial years in a row, Scotland has generated more in revenue and taxation than Westminster has given us back. It's a fact. We have given Westminster for 32 years in a row more money than we've received back. So see when somebody says to you, can we afford the health service? Can we afford the pensions? Can we afford the welfare state? I want you to say that the minute we offer we'll be able to afford them. We can actually make them better. Because we're not going to be giving our money and resources away any longer. And people may say, but Tommy, what about this question? The currency question. You know, they say we can't have the pound, and I've got to say to you folks, I'm in a difficult position, you have got to say, I have to actually like Scotland with some currency. <laughs> Scotland have its own currency underpinned by our oil and our very, very rich resources that we have. However, in the short term, maybe the first two or three years, okay, let's pick ourselves to sterling. The reason I want our own currency, folks, is I don't want the Bank of England to have anything to name we won't be But that'll be transitional period. Okay. Only allow these people who tell us that we are in a unitary union, 1707. England was supposed to have been wound up, Scotland was supposed to have been wound up, and the 1707 treaty was supposed to be the creation of the United Kingdom. So who gave them the right to say that they're keeping the pound? How dare they say that you couldn't have that currency union even for that small period of time? 
wonder what the English businesses have got to say about that when it comes to trading the billions of pounds that they trade here in Scotland and the extra surcharge that they would have to pay if that was the case. It's bluff. Nothing but bluff. Designed to try and frighten us. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to finish by an appeal to you. An appeal to you not to be frightened. An appeal to you to stare your kids and your grandkids in the eye and say, I'm going to fight my hardest for you. It's like the words of the song, one of my favourite songs, Lavi Sifty. Something inside so strong. The higher they build their barriers, the higher we will play. Folks, there's an old trade genius who I tend to quote and finish in my hands, and I'm going to do it here tonight as well. Trade genius who has inspired me throughout my life, a guy called Jim Larkin, who was the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and was involved in trying to organise unorganised doctors in Ireland who were being abused and taken a loan off by the dock owners who hired and fired on a daily basis and at least in William Face fitted or not. Workers were mere cattle. Cast the same. And Jim Larkin was involved in organising those dockers and it resulted in a massive strike in 1913 known as the Dublin Lockout. And do you know what? They lost From that day, the dockers were always organised thereafter. And they lost that part, but they won lots of others after it. And Jim Larkin said, in the course of that dispute, the powerful only appear so because we are on our knees. Brothers and sisters, I say to you, in relation to an independent scholar, Thank you.